Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to the first Zoom webinar of the year. I'm now very thrilled to introduce to you Sue Swain. Sue is a biomimicry practitioner. She's the founder of BioWise. And I was incredibly privileged and lucky, I think it was three or four years ago, to spend a day in the forest with Sue out in the garden roots. And she was incredibly passionate running around the trees and teaching me about regenerative living, just what we can learn from nature, that we are part of nature and that the entire ecosystem can teach us so much. So I hope you're well, hope the Gone Route is treating you well. I know the internet is a little bit unstable, but we're gonna try our best. How are you this evening? I'm great, thanks, Michael. And it's terrific to be connecting with you again. Um, I'm so delighted to be able to do that. And many thanks to Nina for the invite and to Well Coast Conservation for making it all possible. And of course, also just from my side, a very well, well warm good evening <laughs> to all those who have um, tuned in to listen. Um, and I look forward to sharing some thoughts with everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. And I know this lockdown period has even helped even a more of an awakening around biomimicry and enthused your passion and come up with some new ideas. So we're very excited to hear uh, what you have to tell us about this journey. So over to you. Great. Thanks so much. And um, yeah, it has been my involvement with biomimicry has been and remains a really interesting journey that has been has challenged me a lot over the years, but all good challenges, all opportunities for learning. And I'm particularly excited about actually where I'm finding myself um, at this point in time. So I thought it would hopefully have some value and relevance to actually share some of the experience, insights and awareness that I have been graced with along this journey. And, um, and also to share what is going to be effectively a different approach um, to the practice of biomimicry that I hope will resonate with many. And um, to start off with that saying, um, biomimicry is often very aptly described as an awakening or a reawakening. And if I think back, um, my awakening really happened in about 1987. I was just completing my nature conservation studies and had slogged through botany one, two, and three. It was about a week before we were writing, you know, botany three final exams. And it was at that point that lecturers in their wisdom decided again only to show us a viewing of the documentary Sexual Encounters of a Floral Kind. It was a BBC production that simply blew my mind. I mean, with what I recall was the opening sentence, you know, which was said in this conspiratorial tone as only a British can perfect. Flowers are designed for one thing and one thing only, sex. Well, from that moment, I was teleported out from under microscopes and textbooks into this incredible living world of intricate relationships and intrigue. Yeah, ever changed my relationship with, with, the, with the plant kingdom. I mean, you know, just take a look at this. Here they were describing an orchid that over 50 million years had perfected a strategy for achieving pollination that is simply gobsmacking. Not only had the, the flower was mimicking the shape, form and texture, but also able to release the pheromone that was identical to that of a female wasp of a particular species. And on top of it, they also planned the flower to bloom at a moment just before the female wasps would naturally emerge. So what you had flying around was a whole bunch of very desperately sex-starved male wasps. Okay. And then the deception was so amazing that the wasp would actually end up copulating with the flower and that would trigger that hinge mechanism which propelled it into the pollen sacs backwards and forwards and eventually dazed but secretly delighted with the whole experience he'd then fly off and seek out another female wasp to go through the entire experience again and you know where, whereby unwittingly if not enjoyably the pollination service had been completed so that just gives you an idea 
Um, but, you know, for me, that was when I was really woken up to the fact that there is more to nature than meets the eye. And my second um, bit of awakening actually happened the next year when I started my career in conservation as an environmental educator at a center at Cape Point. And suddenly I found the shoe that was on the other foot that, you know, I was now the teacher and tasked with teaching children and adults alike um, about nature in such a way as to um, get them to care about nature and to care for nature. And photosynthesis was going to be one of the things we were chatting about, you know, and I sat back and realized that, my goodness, in all the time that I had studied photosynthesis at school and at, at, at Technicon and that, it had never been presented in a way that made it, brought it alive for me. I mean, I could regurgitate the facts, 15 out of 15, not a problem, quote it backwards, but it meant nothing. Um, and it had never been sold as the most incredible process that occurs on, on planet Earth. You know, it's the reason why there's life on Earth. I guess it was in needing to actually, um, you know, teach about photosynthesis in a way that would evoke wonder that um, I really, really started um, to become a student for the first time. And my... What had happened is that my sense of um, curiosity and awe had been awakened. And from that moment in time, the living world became my alma mater. And, you know, when I wrote that, something just prompted me to look it up. And I guess if I had actually concentrated and paid attention in my Latin classes at school, I would have remembered. The alma mater means nourishing mother which is simply astounding. And I, as a student, the alumnus, that means nursling or the one who is nourished. And boy, from that moment, would I be then nourished in ways I just didn't even realize, you know, let alone appreciate many of the times along the way. But anyway, um, so in becoming the student, I started to then look at, at, um, at nature differently. And it really all started with the tree. When I started to look meaningfully and to, to really think and be wowed by the fact that these organisms are literally rooted to the spot. I mean, they can't just you know, pull themselves up and pop off to the closest pick, pick and pay and buy what's needed. And yet here they were thriving. And in doing that, you know, you start to think more deeply, you start to question more what you're seeing. And I started to think, well, maybe a tree, you know, it's not just a tree, you know, actually it's really a factory, um, but it's unlike any factory that we know of. Um, you know, if you compare that to this, and then you start looking and you start thinking, but hang on a second, this factory, self-assembles itself using locally available abundant resources. It harvests all the water it needs. It is powered entirely by solar energy. Production in this factory is completely silent, so you don't need to don any earmuffs going into this factory, imagine. There are zero toxic emissions. It is able to transport water from basement to penthouse without ESCOM electricity. Um, it's able to add floors as and when necessary. It can self-replicate, self-heal, and it's designed for on-site disassembly. So you think, goodness gracious me, that's quite something. And then you think, but hang on, beyond that, beyond the zero toxic emissions, it's actually producing oxygen. It's giving off pure oxygen as a byproduct to its manufacturing process. It's not only harvesting the rain, it's planting the rain. Every, the tree is designed to put the rain into the ground where it recharges the groundwater and is stored and makes it available basically for every um, other thing that is growing in the forest. So there's a sharing of resources, a providing of habitat that is happening. And a tree, this really blew my mind a little bit, a tree can only drink water if it gives water to the atmosphere. And that's called seeding rain. 
because it has to, because it's using, um, now the word's gone out of my mind, but it's got to set up the, the natural process of moving it up the stem and it has to evaporate water to actually make that happen. Um, so that's the seeding of rain. So this generosity that exists in nature is actually quite extraordinary. And in doing that, it's contributing to water cycles. I, you know, climate change at that stage in 1988 was not a big thing. So the fact that it takes in CO2 was, yeah, that's cool, but it's more about a giving of oxygen that was the more important. So, but now we understand it's cycling, it's contributing to carbon cycles. And remember, we actually need some carbon back in the atmosphere because without CO2, the planet would freeze over. So um, the other thing that it does, it also helps to cool the surrounds, it helps to regulate temperature, and of course, it so, uh, supports local service providers. And now that just gives you an idea of, of what it means to look at nature differently, okay? And, and to really start to um, value it and from a sense of, of some extraordinary things happening out there. So, and you know, in learning to do that, I realized that I'd now gone this lens. I'd, I'd shifted from how things are taught generally in the in schools and at varsities and that, where it, the focus is on learning about nature. We name the tree, we describe its physical attributes. But that's about it. And then comparing it, not always, sorry, that, that's unfair, but, but that's generally the focus. Then comparing it, what life was revealing, you know, this diversity of functioning that is happening um, and the lessons that, that lie therein. So that then is that shift learning from, which to me is, is, is truly beautiful. And so from that moment onward, this informed kind of the way I was going to view nature, um, this new viewing and valuing of nature based on learning from nature. And um, it was to, you know, my, my career, took a, not a, my career didn't change, but I, I then started backpacking up through Africa. I lived in London for a while. I did voluntary conservation in Iceland, came back and worked at Addo Elephant Park, did working for water programs in PE. And all the time I was thinking, how could I share this new viewing and valuing of nature? So I ended up even submitting an application to the National Lotteries in 2004 for a new type of theme park, an environmental theme park based on reconnecting and learning with nature. Um, that's a story for another time. But anyway, what was really interesting was that in 2006, it's got really exciting because that was for the first time that I actually heard of the word biomimicry. I learned of the book written by Janine Benyus called um, Biomimicry Innovation Inspired by Nature. And suddenly I realized, wow, not only were there a whole bunch of people out there thinking along the same lines, but an entire book had been written on the topic. And so that was a real aha moment for me. And that was when I was really introduced to biomimicry as a science and a practice, um, which was an approach to innovation, okay, based on learning from nature's genius. And again, when you don that lens, when you don that lens that is, we're now going to learn from nature, you start to open yourself up to recognizing and um, humbly acknowledging nature's true, true genius. Normally, you know, if I was to ask you who have we got here, normally the response would be, okay, we've got a kingfisher, spider, termite, and a gecko. And of course, that's right. But if we start to look differently, you might say to yourself, but hang on a second, with that kingfisher, I mean, if you look at that beak that is already entering the water, entered the water, there's not so much as a ripple, let alone a splash you start to realize there's some serious engineering genius happening there. And of course it makes sense. He's, you know, wanting to catch fish, a splash and that would frighten away the fish. So um, that was, you know, something else. And then looking at the spider and thinking, well, but hang on, have we not got a, you know, a miracle material scientist here? Because you've got a creature that literally takes a fly in one end and produces a miracle material out the other end. Okay, um, and a material that ounce for ounce is five times stronger than steel. 
and it's all done in the body of the of the um, of the spider. So there's some extraordinary chemistry that must be happening there. And then you consider the termite and its and its mound, and you start to understand that these organisms are able to um, regulate the temperature and humidity and keep it at a constant ideal temperature and humidity for them. Because remember, we're not even the first farmers. What's happening in that termite mound is actually they're farming um, a fungus and a fungus requires a particular temperature and humidity. And they're able to maintain that. And, you know, and wherever I looked, wherever I came across a termite mound, I never found it plugged into ESCOM electricity. So they were kind of achieving this using some kind of method that had to involve architectural ingenuity because they would keep the temperature and humidity whether temperatures were soaring to 55 degrees or plummeting to zero degrees. They were able to achieve that. And then lastly, looking at the gecko and you start to think, okay, so, you know, gecko is running across ceilings and rock faces and all of that. It wants to be able to stick while on the move and traditionally, one would think, you know, there are suckers or something like that. And then you look at the undersurface and you think, but hang on, there's some extraordinary physics that is being tapped into here as well. And then that opens the door to really questioning deeper and looking for, for um, maybe strategies and principles that have been adopted. And back to the kingfisher, you start to see that here is, you know, the design principle of fit and form function, but also incorporating multifunctionality, because that beak is not only the means by which it can enter without creating a flash, it's the means by which it actually pierces and catches the fish too. And then with the, the um, spider, you realize that, yeah, what, what we have an example of here is life-friendly chemistry. I mean, it is chemistry that is happening inside the body of the spider, that so it cannot afford for there to be any toxicity related to it. And it's even able to um, produce a web that is actually entirely edible. Now, by comparison, we can we have you know created a, a similar um, product in Kevlar, which is that bulletproof case and that. Um, the difference is that you know we boil it up in sulfuric acid, put it under extreme pressure and temperature to produce the the extruded into fibers and produce all sorts of toxic waste while we do that. And I can't imagine us being able to eat that Kevlar best after it has served its purpose. So it is humbling indeed when you start to consider um, what is happening there. And then with the architectural ingenuity of the, the um, termite mound, you understand that they are simply tapping into freely available physical forces that are provided for free by this planetary home of ours. You know, as simple as something as simple as almost hot air rises and cold air sinks. And with the gecko, you also start to realize that hang on, nature seems to tap into physics first and foremost, almost before chemistry. And it is all based on context, however. But if you think with regards to a gecko, he wants to move quickly without falling off. Um, and that to, to develop. Uh, a chemical adhering means of adhering requires energy to make the chemical on, on a, on a um, regular basis. Whereas if you if this, the physical structure has grown with you as you've, as you've developed, it, it is almost an energy free means of adhesion. So tapping into physics first and foremost makes sense um, also in terms of nature's wisdom there. Um, and so what this then leads to is an understanding that we can now learn from nature's models and processes to potentially solve our human design and sustainability challenges. So one of the classic examples, which I do like to mention because it gives a very nice illustration, um, is that of the design challenge the designers of the Shinkansen bullet train. Um, which was called a bullet plane because of the rounded nose cone, but that pushed air in front of it, which resulted in a massive sonic boom when the train exited a tunnel. Uh, exited a tunnel. And um, so they turned to the engineers and said, you have to fix this. The one engineer happened to be a, a, a birder and a biomimic. 
And he said to himself, well, what faces the same challenges as differences in air pressure? Because that was what was causing this differences in density as it entered and exited a tunnel. And he came up with obviously the kingfisher diving through air into water. So they simply redesigned the front nose cone to match the shape of the kingfisher beak. And not only was sonic boom a thing of the past, um, but there was 15% less electricity required, 10% faster and 10% quieter overall. So suddenly you had this multifunctionality emerging simply by, by turning to one of nature's extraordinary models. And this then you know, opens up a whole field that, that you start realizing just how many examples of um, biomimicry inspired innovation there are out there having learned from nature's models. From the cockle bird to even nature's flooring, even our very own blood vessels, which I think is a, a really important one to highlight. The, the cockle burr, of course, gave rise to the Velcro, okay, multi-billion dollar industry that came from a, a, a scientist um, who walked his dog in the field in, in, in Sweden, came home with the dog covered in burrs, being curious, he put it under a microscope, discovered how it had hooks and barbs that hooked it onto the fur, and there you have a, a material called Velcro that was designed from that. So your... Um, this is an interesting one because this particular company called Interface has been on a very interesting journey, starting off with these carpet tiles that they produce. But the problem with the carpet tiles was that if you spill red wine on it and you try to replace one carpet tile, you can immediately see it's new and you end up having to pay, replace the whole carpet or whole sections of it. Until they said, well, you know, how would nature do this? They looked at nature's flooring and they looked at you know, pebbles on a beach, um, leaf litter on the forest floor and realized that nature is full of random patterns. So instead of having a uniform pattern, which is what we normally have in our, um, in our, our carpeting, they, they designed a, um, a random pattern, which meant they could replace individual tiles and you would never pick up on it. And that reduced waste to landfill by 90% which was really well. And, and then lastly, the blood vessels, but specifically the platelets um, that help to um, cause clotting when we um, have a, a, a tear in our um, blood vessels. And this was used um, by a company called Brinker Technologies who said, well, you know, what about all the water pipes that we lay and the problems that we have, we're losing between 40 and 64% of our water to leaking pipes. Now they are able to, they have, you know, generated in, in laboratories um, nature-inspired platelets which get injected into the pipeline can alert you where a, a seal, a hole is if it's too big, or they can even, uh, um, you know, gather there and actually um, self-heal, uh, self-seal the pipeline. So, um, which points to the fact that we're as much nature as everything else out there, there are dozens if not hundreds of lessons from our own human body we could be learning and I think what's really important for us to get is that this new viewing on valuing therefore shifted our thinking from viewing nature as a warehouse of resources merely existing for us to extract from it becoming to viewing it as a library of solutions we could be learning from and when you actually um you know, don that mask, again, it starts opening up other opportunities, like what happened with the Zimbabwean architect in the early 90s to mid 90s, um, Mick Pierce, and um, was tasked with building a new time, a new uh, shopping mall and, and, and office complex. He was fascinated with termites, basically studied them and started to learn from nature's processes and designed the Eastgate building in Harare to, to function according to the stepping into the same um, nat you know, naturally occurring physical forces. Um, but also very much in context because Harare, like these termite mounds, they function well if there is a big temperature difference between day and nighttime temperatures. And what he achieved is a building that basically requires 90% less energy than any other building of comparable size that uses 90% less electricity. So this is a wonderful example of um, learning from nature's processes to start solving some of our sustainability challenges. But of course, it's still made with concrete, cement. 
And if you start thinking about cement and the fact that it is limestone that we then go and mine, we then transport it, put it under extreme temperatures and pressures, pressure to produce the cement that then gets bagged and shipped halfway around the world. The challenge with cement is that for every ton of cement produced, a ton of CO2 is released into the atmosphere. And um, coming from the burning of fossil fuels, essentially. Until this one company came along and said, but hang on, limestone is the bodies of ancient coral reefs. What if we were to mim uh, mimic the recipe of the coral reef, which releases a molecule that, um, you know, absorb, that um, takes the CO2 that's dissolved in healthy water and uses that as its building block? And basically simplifying the science that effectively is what they do. They bubble CO2 through salty water to produce the cement base. So the thinking is that you could have this one factory belting out CO2 and the cement making factory next door ca capturing that CO2, bubbling it through salty water and producing the cement base, um, which is regarded as a game-changing innovation. Um, and it, it does mean we're starting to get it right because nature has never regarded CO2 as something to fear and, and that it uses it as a, as a building block, as a feedstock. Um, so that, that's an important I, I, idea, but for me, it's also considering, but hang on, if we're taking that cement and just going to use it, and I can't remember who sings this, but if we're going to simply use it to pave paradise and put in another parking lot that is impervious, doesn't allow um, rainfall to recharge groundwater, and we're just building new buildings that are only going to be occupied for eight hours a day, perhaps we're missing the point again. And, um, and that brings us to thinking, well, maybe, maybe just maybe we should be quieting our cleverness a bit more, taking a step back, taking a collective breath and really consulting our planetary elders more. Maybe we need to start thinking in systems. And if that's the case, maybe we need to start consulting systems like forests. And if you think about it, I can't actually see, okay, there we go. If, if you think about it, I mean, a forest basically has the same functional needs as a town. You've got energy that needs to be generated. You've got water needs and that need to be met. You've got waste and resources that need to be managed. You've got communication that needs to happen, food that needs to be produced. I'm sure you can see the marketing and advertising that is even happening here. We've got transportation and courier services that are required. So as a, as a system that is functioning pretty much like our economic systems do, it has merit in consulting it and looking at it. And it has double merit when you consider the fact that this system never, ever, without fail, into fossil fuel. Never has, never will. Okay, and on top of that, there is also no waste, no depleting, no poisoning, no polluting of the system, and there is also no unemployment in a forest system. Okay, so, you know, just imagine that. But also more than that, you know, is, is that life doesn't stop only min minimizing our negative impact. Life looks at, at, at basically positively contributing all the time. How can it maintain community? How can it create the conditions in which life can thrive there? And these principles and these strategies are applied the world over in every ecosystem. These are universal, universal patterns and strategies are applied according to local context, so they will be applied differently in, in different contexts, but the principles and strategies remain the same. So the thinking is surely this is what we need to be actually looking at. Um, for me, then the, the problem or, or the questions start to arise again with what seems to be our obsession or preoccupation with our cleverness. Um, in biomimicry, we constantly talk about quieting our cleverness and, and clothing ourselves in humility. And that is not something we, we generally do, um, particularly maybe architects and engineers who are particularly creative people and one understands that. 
seriously, we need to actually start thinking more, you know, because the talk now is of these smart cities and smart technology that, you know, your house will pick up that you're going to be arriving in 15 minutes time and will start turning on lights and, and all sorts of things like that. Um, which is all good and well because they could solve save energy and all of that. But one wonders whether the greater connections that they are providing us with will not actually diminish the real quality of the connections that we have. And the other thing is something like this, which thank you, Michael, for alerting me to this yesterday. Somebody like Elon Musk putting out there that he is um, putting out a reward, a hundred million dollar reward for a carbon capture technology. Okay, and then if you read the MIT um, article, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and you discover that, you know, well, one scale, full scale direct air capture plant could cost up to $500 million to produce. And no doubt, it's a technology that we will use fossil fuel to build in any case. So by the time it comes carbon neutral, most probably five, seven, 10 years have gone down the line or whatever. You know, you start to come up with new acronyms because the one that came to mind, I didn't really want to repeat. I, I changed it to what on earth do we think we're doing? And it also, I thought this is quite a, a very cool little thing where, you know, I talked to someone about climate change and they told me that quite soon, we will be able to, you know, invent this carbon capture machine. You know, and um, yeah, you know, it already exists, but it already exists in, in much greater things than just efficiency. It's that multifunctional effectiveness, that multi-benefit outcome that we learned of when I went through the tree earlier. That is what's truly astounding. And here we're looking at producing a, a single, you know, function thing that, that, yeah. And we don't give consideration to the fact that while we're building this, we are destroying these living entities that are performing that particular function and service just by the way that they live. We're destroying them at a rate of apparently football fields every 15 seconds or something like that. And we're doing nothing stop the abstraction of fossil fuels that's actually causing the CO2 build up in the first place. So doing things in isolation makes no sense, you know, and perhaps a reward would be better given to local communities to help restore, replant, replenish and regenerate the very forests that have been annihilated um, to meet our perceived needs and, and, and definitely just what, what I want. So um, with that rant, I will move on to the next one. Um, I think really, let me just, sorry, I just want to um, get to where I wanted to say things, yeah. Um, so for me, what is really important is that we need a, a fundamental shift maybe. I am not sure we have matured enough as a species to really run with technology, Michael even if it's technology modeled after nature's models and processes, because we simply don't fully get or comprehend the full complexity and utter genius of nature and the all important wisdom contained within life's time-tested proven strategies and principles and patterns. And we haven't yet learned to humble ourselves sufficiently and quieten our cleverness. I really think that is the problem. However, I do think biomimicry still has a critically important part to play. And this is what really excites me. But in, in, in acknowledging that we're still effectively toddlers, you see, biomimicry is, is, is based on the premise and understanding that plants, animals, and microbes have been around for 3.8 billion years. And in that time, they have evolved into the consummate architects, engineers, and designers, and the ecosystems in which they live are economies beyond compare. They have done everything we've ever desired to do, but have done it without ever tapping into fossil fuel, polluting the planet, or destroy or, or jeopardizing its future. So we've only been around for 200,000 years. We're absolute toddlers. And, and our approach to technology is like, mom, look at me, look at me, I can do it better. 
we're talking about photosynthesis. People are talking about, oh, we, we can, we've got photosynthetic cells now that function more efficiently than a leaf. But a leaf is not focused on efficiency. Nature designs for effectiveness and that, that multiple benefits and, and multifunctional, um, you know, so yeah. Anyway, so what if we were to have a new approach, a biomimicry traditionally and, and, and via Janine Benius who, who coined the word and, and wrote the seminal book. It was an approach to innovation. So what if we said, okay, well, maybe we're not quite ready for that yet, but what if we were to use it as an approach to living, a way of being? And I think this now suddenly started to really excite me. Where we, where some of the things that niggled a little bit, where, yes, the valuing of nature, instead of just seeing it as a warehouse of resources to abstract from, we now consider it a library of solutions we can be learning from. Within that was still the, the, um, the concern that it will still just become a warehouse of solutions we are learning from. That we would put nature to work for us. We would, um, you know, torture it for its secrets. Now the secrets weren't just for discovering, but it was for, for creating, um, you know, better technologies inspired by nature. But with this, where we look at it as, an, uh, as, an, as a way of being, essentially what we're saying is a new valuing of nature, not as a warehouse, not as a library, but how about seeing it as our quintessential living guide? thriving on earth. I just let that sink in just a little bit. Okay, and, and what I mean by that is, is where we consciously, intentionally, and with intent, focus on five things. We focus on reconnecting with life, but reconnecting deeply with meaning, purpose, and intent. And, in, and through that reconnecting, we focus on learning from life with humility, with understanding that these are our planetary elders, that there is wisdom beyond our, our imagination that we can tap into. And with conscious intent, to start functioning seamlessly as nature, as life and with life working symbiotically with life. And that word symbiotically is really important because a lot of the time there is a, a lot of working with nature, but it's again, it's putting nature to work for us as if nature only exists to serve us. And really importantly, being an integral part of life on earth. And seeing those, um, those five actions um, almost starting to consider them essential life skills that result in two things. The result in the first one is, is living sustainably. And with living sustainably, what I mean by that, and I put it always in inverted commas, because if I said to you, what's your relationship like with your partner? And you said to me, oh, it's sustainable. I'd say, oh, I'm sorry, that doesn't sound too hot. But if you said, oh, no, it's lacquer, it's great, we're thriving, we're continually improving and getting better and just celebrating each other, that's wonderful. So living sustainably, what I mean by that is being able to um, sustain ourselves over the long haul. And that means on a set, by necessity on a closed system planet, it means living regeneratively. But to live sustainably, by definition, we have to be living regeneratively. But I think life on Earth is more than that. It's more than just about living regeneratively. That's fantastic. But it's also about living fully. And this is what really, really excites me. Um, living sustainably, this living regeneratively means really consulting and being guided by life as to how to do that. But living fully is living in deep, meaningful relationship with life and awakening our inner knowing. 
Mm -hmm. There is so much more that we are part and parcel of this magnificent thing called life on earth that we are, can be integrated with. Um, it's really so important, I think, that we start teaching ourselves a moment. That's absolutely wonderful because I'm on the last two slides, thanks. Um, we need to stop telling ourselves the narratives that we have been telling ourselves up to now that no longer serve us, okay? One that says, we're alone. We're all alone in this universe. Let's go and look for life out there. My goodness, we've got between 50 and 100 million species just trying to enter into meaningful relationship with us. Narrative that says, yeah, but we're completely separate from these species. We're different from, separate from. Goodness gracious me, do we realize that we have more microbial cells in our human bodies than human cells? We are a composite species, kept alive by the microbes that live within us, okay? very you know awful narrative that said that placed us at the top of this pyramid that we are masters that nature exists to serve us okay we're not and it doesn't but the more damaging one and the one that i've been responsible I've, I've also spoken about this and it's messages that came through during this COVID time that come through as a result of climate change the message that's looked at this pyramid and says wow okay only one that can be removed from that and the pyramid remains in fact is man and by that we're telling ourselves we're utterly superfluous life would be better off without us we mean nothing to life we need to stop that because that means we're starting to act out the feeling of being superfluous superfluous and I believe that we need to move from this egocentric um, view of things to the ecocentric one the one where we understand my word, we are so part and parcel of this. And entering into that deep, meaningful relationship with life will mean that we will awaken the inner knowing that says to us, we are part and parcel of this. Okay, that we are, that we belong, that we are a valued member. I'd like you to picture the, the female figure and the male figure as outlines, that this is a jigsaw puzzle. And yes, at the moment, we are outside of it, put out there by ourselves and the choices we've made. But life in all this time has held that place for us and is just waiting for us to step back in, become fully integrated with the rest of life on Earth and become integral to it. And that is what awaits us. The ability, the, the, you know, the, 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 the realization that we're not a species lost. There is a niche for us to fill. There is a purpose for us to take up and therein to find our full potential, our meaning and our purpose as a, as, as a species. And that together with this fantastic circle of life, we learn that we're actually there to serve all life. And yeah, that's it, thank you. Thank you, Sue. That was fantastic. And thank you for all your energy. Can I ask a favor that you stop sharing the screen? So oh, yes, thank you. can see it a bit bigger. If any of you have some questions, please won't you type them in the chat function or the Q&A function. Um, Sue is working on doing an online course. It's going to take a couple of months and she's also writing a book. So as soon as that is done, we will also share that with all of you on our monthly newsletters. So I really found that fascinating. What I love about what you said there was quietening our cleverness. And maybe I can just start by asking practically, how do you do that? And, and how, do we, how do we start to become aware? How do we start to notice some of these things? And uh, how, how does one do that apart from just being curious? Yeah, look, that, that's a great question. And these are the kind of things that I'm, I'm, I'm figuring out what you, how to put this in the course because that, that, they are so important. And I think, you know, what I discovered when I did my mimicry courses is how quick and easy it is to leap to what we already know. Okay, so um, instance like one thing would be you would be blindfolded and, and you're given artifacts, natural artifacts. And 
you, you are now asked to describe them. Now, the reason why we want you to describe them is, is to actually de understand the function that that, that is um, performing, okay? But immediately you find your brain is thinking, oh, this is a, this is a protea flower, this is a something else, this is a that, you know? And, and it's learning to try and um, quieten what we know and to really tap into, um, the, the, you know, what, what is happening here, what isn't happening here and why, based on observation um, and, and based on this inner knowing. That's one thing that we need to understand is that we are genetically wired to even get that quintessential living guide. It was embedded in our DNA from the moment we were conceived. Um, we're part and parcel of this planet, the same ele chemical elements, everything. Um, so, so it's we have been taught too much. We've got too many facts and figures without any heart and meaning and that having been brought into it. So, um, it, so it's really about when you're going out there, thinking to yourself, am I tapping into what I think I already know, what I've heard, what I've learned, or am I actually consulting this organism that I am engaging with right here, right now? I don't know, does that make sense? It does make sense. So you have the first couple of questions. Um, uh, the first one is a fantastic reflection. Hope many schools will receive some of this as a guide for future living. How do you see this happening? Um, you know what? Nature teaches us about decentralized and localized and things like that. I do think see this whole thing happening is that localization by regionalization and decentralization has to be the way we go. I mean, I have just in the last two months been approached by two private schools in Neisner to incorporate biomimicry and for me to give a presentation at the um, Montessori, International Montessori Conference that is going to be held in Neisner. So that is, I will certainly be introducing it as that, but it, it means to maybe going to the local um, education department who's based in Nasna and saying, how about we just come see if we can't introduce some other life skills, not knocking or, or saying no to the existing ones, but saying, Let, let's get some, some other things happening here. So but I think it, it happens, you know, um, nature teaches us to build from the bottom up, develop, you know, slowly integrate development with growth. That was a big learning curve when I'd envisioned this, you know, huge <laughs> discovery park, which I'm so glad we weren't able to build because it would have been the biggest white elephant now with this tourism thing and everything like that. But um, enabling it to happen on this decentralized scale, yeah, I think that, that's really how it's going to happen. Well, if you ever do do an online version that people can use, whether it's homeschooling or other, I think it would be super useful. Um, Helen, mm. author, the author you mentioned, Jenny, uh, the, the author you mentioned during your talk, who wrote the book, can you just mention that again? Sure, it's um, Benin, Benin, yes, B-E-N-Y-U-S. Okay, yeah. great. And um, yeah, it's a fantastic, really um, fantastic book. And, and everything that um, even is based on this approach of, um, of biomimicry as a way of being is actually contained in that book. Um, it's just that the focus in the beginning, it was, was the innovation thing, you know, so there's so much wisdom in that book and it's really great to read. Uh, this, this person is asking, how can biomimicry be used in the medical industry? Do you know of any examples or how it is being used? Um, yep, you know that gecko um, foot, that, that's Van der Waal's forces, which is um, a, a force of attraction that happens at um, nano level. And um, it's a very weak force made powerful, made strong by the millions of connections because each underfoot is co consists of hundreds of hairs and each hair is split into hundreds of little ends. And those molecules literally merge with the wall molecule as it moves. And they've actually used that to develop a new type of um, uh, like uh, instead of using stitching in, in, in um, surgery on blood vessels, delicate surgery, you've got this gecko tape because you can, you, you know, when you see the gecko running, it's, it's a very smooth, it just, it, it just um, peels off gently. You can't afford to you know, stick 
and, and have people you know, run like that. So this will be a very gentle thing. Um, the other really interesting one is the, um, and maybe relates to COVID and the vaccinations that are being brought out and the problems with that are being experienced with being able to keep them cold, okay, is that um, you've got this wonderful organism called the tardigrade or the water bear. And um, he's able to, he lives in ponds and that, but when the conditions are becoming unfavorable and starting to dry out, he's able to dehydrate himself, okay, and lose up to 90% of his body moisture, encapsulates himself in a sugar coating and can remain like that for decades, 50 years. What, and as soon as he comes back into contact with, with water, it springs back to life. So that's a form of preservation. And I just, uh, the name of the company escapes me at the moment, but they have developed a, a, a similar thing for vaccines where they can be encapsulated in, in that kind of thing. It now eliminates the need for fridges. And um, once it's injected and comes into contact with, with water in the bloodstream, it, you know, it's a completely viable vaccine. So now you don't need to worry about getting, um, uh, so, you know, um, Bridges and that into into the middle of rural areas, you just don't need it anymore. Yeah. Um, do you think that COVID, in a way, because we were all stuck in one place for a long time, that in a way it kind of forced us? I found just myself noticing, you know, the swallows or just whatever else was happening much more than I ordinarily would. You know, I'd be busy going and doing something or filming somewhere. But that that yeah. has in a way like you've had a few more epiphanies on your journey mm. in a way that's something to be thankful for. No, absolutely. I, I think it brought about an, in, an enforced slowing down. It was certainly, I mean, I know when, <laughs> when the, the lockdown happened first, I mean, I started, I think, manically creating water. You know, how am I going to earn anything and what am I going to do? And, you know, and all of this. And eventually, exhausted from that a few months down the line, I started to just roll over and float. And that's when things actually started to change for me. And I think there definitely has been a huge um, awareness of the degree to which we need nature. The degree, you know, um, as soon as they, people could, they had, you know, these circles in, in parks in the UK where people could go and sit safely out in nature and, and that. So I think, um, you know, there, there's certainly a lot to be, in terms of what COVID could, could we lessons we could draw from that. And I think it has helped us to think, well, maybe do we need quite as many buildings as we do? Look at how many are standing empty. Maybe, just maybe I don't need to spend half my life commuting to and from work. Maybe, just maybe I don't need half the stuff I thought I needed. You know, so I think it has started to raise a lot of questions. And we also saw how nature was coming back and nature's resilience is extraordinary. So biomimicry to me, what I love about biomimicry is it is not the doom and gloom message. It's saying, good grief, we're part of something extraordinary. We too can be extraordinary if we clothe ourselves in humility, learn from the planetary elders and pick that up and run with it. My goodness, you know, um, it's just simply awesome. And, um, and I'd like to thank um, Prof Mike Bruton, who actually got me to do my first online presentation. I'm not sure I want to thank you for that, Mike, but anyway, that was for South East Africa. But um, he asked a, a question after that talk about, um, you know, are we the only species that doesn't have, hasn't got a niche? And that, you know, really spoke to thinking that I had been mulling on for, for many, a time, many a day and everything. So. And, and that's exactly right. It is about us stepping in, finding that niche, that purpose, that we've got purpose on this planet, you know, and it's not to get the next TV and all things like that. It's actually be part of this, this, this amazing, you know, um, living world and be contributing um, beautifully to its well-being. Yeah. Could have said it better. Thank you, Sue. That's that's so beautiful, and uh, we'll all try and be a bit more extraordinary and try to contribute more. And we wish you well on your journey. And thank you for taking the time to to prepare this and to share your knowledge with us. Keep keep well, and we really look forward to your book and your courses. And thank you for flying the flag so so much for nature. We really appreciate what you're doing. Have a great evening. Thank you.
Thanks, Michael. You too. Just in. Just everyone. Bye bye.